the children. I wonder if any of the children or adults possibly have said this through the holidays. Are we nearly there yet? <laughs> so adults and children, I think, sometimes say that. Yeah, it's one of the most common questions that is often asked on a journey, usually from a small person in the back. Are we nearly there yet? I remember starting a journey in Devon, traveling along the small winding roads uh, before we hit the wonderful M5 uh, from Exeter north. After only about 30 minutes of traveling, a voice came from the back. Are we nearly there yet? We were traveling all the way to Scotland. <laughs> no, <laughs> we are not nearly there. We've been on a, a journey through the summer, uh, traveling together, and there have been many twists and turns along the way. But I am delighted to say that we have arrived. We've arrived. Psalms 132 to 134 are the end of the journey. We have reached Zion or Jerusalem. You may remember that God's people, the Israelites, traveled on this journey three times a year to go and worship the Lord together for three different festivals. Their focus as they arrive is on the Lord. It is worship. It is coming to Jerusalem, to the temple, to be together with God's people. Now, if you look at Psalm 133 with me and verse 1, we see that word together. It says how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together. And there is a very similar word that goes with it. Together in unity. This means as one. It means united. And it means it's not just external, but it's a oneness of heart. Here's my illustration for this. Classic banana. Brilliant. Looks good. But the outside is not really what we want. Somebody's going to tell me you can eat the skin. Yes, you can. But what we're looking for is the goodness on the inside, okay? The unity we're talking about this morning is not external. It is the good stuff on the inside. I'm not going to take a bite. I'm not going to be able to speak, but that's the good stuff. So Warwick has already helped us think about things that unite and divide us. There are plenty of things, aren't there, as we've discovered some less important than others, <laughs> but plenty. But something that cuts across all these things is our unity in Christ Jesus. Now, what, what, unites, what unites, say, Jess and Craig and Nick, I'm going to be fast on my feet, and Ruth and Jeanette, what unites these people is not Derby County Football Club or cross-stitching or cooking creme brulee, or maybe you bake that, or even bird spotting. What unites these people is their hope and joy and salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's greater than the, the unity shared within a sports team or by the supporters. It's greater than any community group. It's greater than any other religion. It's greater than even the unity within your own family. Deeper than all these things is our unity in Christ. Uh, and notice how the psalmist David puts this. He calls it good and pleasant. Good and pleasant. So the literal translation is, look how good and how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Well, I wonder what in life do you find good and pleasant? If you're comfortable, turn to a neighbor. I want you to think about things that you find good and pleasant in life. Let me give you an example. On a hot summer's day, it is good and pleasant 
to have a cold, refreshing drink. Okay, a minute just to think about things that you find good and pleasant in life. Okay, good and pleasant things. Well, I wonder what came up. Hands up if you said something that was food or drink related. <laughs> Maybe it was chocolate, anyone chocolate? Yeah. <laughs> what about a favorite meal? Favorite drink? Anyone's <laughs> favorite drink? Um, what about your sports team? Maybe being there and they win, support them. Anyone say a team? Yeah, a few for that. What about health? Uh, when you're feeling better after being unwell, that can feel really good. Um, or children, I reckon the last day of school before you hit the school holidays, that's a good and pleasant day. Or, or if it's your last day of work, before you're about to go and you put the out of office on, that is good and pleasant, isn't it? But out of all these good and pleasant things... What about God's grace? Good and pleasant. Out of all these things that we find good and pleasant, where, where does God's love and God's forgiveness come? Uh, when we think about what it means to know Jesus as Saviour and Lord and to be known by him, when we consider again our need of, our, of a saviour with our many, many sins, when we realise the depth of God's love, that he didn't give up on us, he didn't even withhold his only son, but sent him and gave him for us to die upon that cross. Undeserving, yet deeply loved. What grace. Look, how good and how pleasant when the people of God, when God's children live together in unity, when we gather because of God's grace. It, and it's stunning and it's beautiful because it's a reflection of the greatest and most perfect unity in the entire universe. That unity displayed in the Godhead, enjoyed by the Trinity. Children, I wonder if you can tell me who are the three members of the Trinity. We've got God the... Yes, at the back. God the Father. Who can tell me another one? God the... Yes. God the Spirit, brilliant. And one more, God the, yeah, God the Son, God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. They enjoy the best unity that there is. And guys, we get to reflect something of that wonderful unity. In fact, it's even better than that. We become part of that unity in Christ. But that's another sermon. <laughs> We are united in Christ. How good and how pleasant is that? But what does that look like then for us as a church? What does that mean, how we display that? We're going to think about that in just a moment. But let me just hand back to Warwick. Uh, with me to Psalm 133. Thanks, Warwick. 
So I wonder if you noticed in the psalm, as it was read earlier, there's a picture of flowing in the psalm. So if you look at Psalm uh, verse 2, it is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard. Again, running down on Aaron's beard. And then in verse 3, it is as if the dew of Hermon was falling on, or the same words, running down on Mount Zion. There is a flowing theme in this psalm. In the words of Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, the floodgates of heaven have been opened and much blessing is poured out. That oneness and unity in the Trinity has flowed out to us. Uh, Jesus prays in John 17 that we all may be one, just as the Father and Jesus are one. This unity flows to us and then flows from us out to others. And so verses 2 and 3 of our passage poetically describe two things about this unity. So the first thing in verse 2. Let, let's read verse 2 again. It's like the precious oil poured out on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. Now when you read passages in the Bible, there are certain words that it's good to look out for. Three words that we've just read. Oil, Aaron, and robes. As soon as you see those words in a passage, think priest, think priest. The priest was set apart, he was made holy. The Bible word is consecrated. That's a big word, isn't it? Consecrated, should we say that together? Consecrated. So again, consecrated. It means set apart. God's people in the Bible are described as a kingdom of priests. What does our unity therefore do as a kingdom of priests? It sets us apart. We are consecrated. Uh, we are not the same as everyone else. We are not like any other club. Uh, there is no unity like ours that we share together in Christ. So firstly, our unity, it sets us apart. There is something special and different about us. But the second thing in verse 3, it says, It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. The second thing about our unity, it, it brings us together. Now, we have a picture of dew falling from Hermon onto Zion. Now, both of these are mountains. Um, here is a map on the screen to show you where these two mountains were. So you've got Mount Hermon at the top, Mount Zion in the bottom. So after the death of King Solomon, Israel divided into two kingdoms, Israel in the north, Judah in the south, it was a divided kingdom, okay? The point is that our unity brings us together. So rather than division between the two, we've got dew from the north falling on the mountain in the south. It's a picture of the divided being brought together in unity. Now I accept this is a bit strange. Uh, the watery, watery dew we see it on grass, it doesn't really flow anywhere, does it? It just sits and then evaporates. But of, the, of course, the Lord can make the dew from one mountain fall on another in that um, idea or picture of bringing unity through his son. Something that was once divided is brought together by the work of his Holy Spirit. Our unity brings us together. Now, both these things are attractive. Now, boys and girls, I wonder if you enjoy playing with magnets. 
Brought some magnets in with me. What do magnets do? They attract the right thing. Does somebody want to come out and help me? Any willing volunteers who likes playing with magnets? Ooh. Yeah, Abigail, someone's coming up. Let's see what these magnets can attract. Do you want to feel the weight of my keys? They're quite heavy, aren't they? Should we see if this magnet can lift them up? Do you want to hold the magnet? Do you want to hold the magnet? If you turn around, actually, everyone will see. I'm going to let go of the keys. This is going to work. You, you let go of the key. Can it hold it? Is this going to work? It did in my office. And it's not working. It's... Oh, never mind. Let's try something else. Most magnets attract. Let's try the battery. Go for it. Lift it up. These are the worst magnets I've ever seen. <laughs> Let's try this really, really heavy plate. Try the heavy go. Just with the magnets. Oh, last turn around. Quick turn around. Ooh. Honestly, honestly, I'm taking these back. There we go, there we go. Magnets are meant to be attractive. Thank you very much, Abigail. And that, that is how our unity is meant, meant to be. be. Being set apart is good. People are looking for something different, something better, something special. We're meant to be attractive. Uh, seeing a, a group of people of different ages and stages in life who, who would otherwise be divided into lots of little groups, but brought together is attractive. Uh, some of the youth went to Oaks this week. What a brilliant example of unity across ages. So what is the fruit of our unity here? What does it look like? How does God's grace shape our unity as a church across the differences we may have? How are we being attractive? Well, let me ask, do we love each other as Christ has loved us? Do we love each other as Christ has loved us? Are we willing to forgive 70 times 7? Are, are we quick to think more highly of others than ourselves? Do we show that love covers a multitude of sins? Do we remember that it is to one's glory to overlook an offence that you might have received? Our unity in the Lord is to be displayed in us. It is to flow out from us. Our grasp of the gospel of God's amazing grace to us is seen in the very relationships we have with each other. Now, sometimes that's really hard. We can do and say really hurtful things. And we need help and prayer and wisdom to reconcile and if, if that's you and you're struggling with someone else, please come and speak to me or Warwick or another elder or someone you trust because we want to help reconcile those relationships. But how good and how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And the, the outcome is in verse 3. It's both a blessing and I think it's a challenge. I've put on the slide the end of verse 3 and it's the ESV translation. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. That word bestow in the NIV means command. The Lord commands his blessing of eternal life. Of course he does. When we're one in Christ with our future secure in him, 
there is a real sense of assurance, or there should be. Where there is unity, God commands eternal life. So where is the challenge? Well, the psalmist assumes unity. Yes, in Christ, but also with each other. He assumes unity. And so where there is not this, and this is not true in a relationship here or elsewhere, where forgiveness is needed or reconciliation, I encourage you to reach out today. Pray for each other for the restoring of unity and continued unity of God's people. The psalm says this is really important. And when we have unity, he commands the blessing of eternal life. Look, look how good and how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. For there, where there is unity, the Lord commands his blessing of life forevermore. Let's stop, let's pray. Let's pause for a moment. Maybe you can just reflect on your own relationships here and elsewhere. Is there somewhere the Lord needs to work? Let me pray these words of Paul. May you live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Amen.